Okay, so exception handling works pretty much the same way in uh, C++ as it works in Java. In fact, um, Java got its exception handling capabilities from uh, C++. So you may not have gotten exception handling in your Java class. Uh, if you took it with me, you should have. Um, although there's a few things that we may not have covered. So I'll go through it as if uh, you pretty much don't have it. <clears throat> so we'll talk about handling exceptions. And an exception is essentially a fancy word for an error. Something goes wrong, something unexpected, potentially causing the program to crash and burn, uh, which we don't want to have happen. That's a bad thing. So uh, there's a couple of ways of handling it. Um, C++ has something called an exception handler. Um, and you can, d you can actually use the built-in ones or you can uh, define your own. And it's possible to have a single exception area handle multiple throws and catches, as we call them, and we'll see what that is a little bit later. Um, although you can define them to handle multiple, they only can handle one specifically at a time. And the computer will only throw one at a time as well, by the way. We'll talk about the uh, exception uh, programming techniques for exception handling. Uh, you can throw them yourselves, or in many cases, uh, the program will throw them for you. Um, something happens. An exception, like trying to open a file that doesn't exist, or trying to write to a file that's read only. That's an exception. And there are different types of, and you can define your own as well. <coughs> so, a um, typical approach to developing a program is to write the program assuming everything goes as planned. Right, and just get the thing working without you know, you know, wor throwing in any faulty data. So you may have done that with tic tac toe. Um, you may have wrote it and made sure that you only entered the correct input. Maybe you turned that in, and I of course tried incorrect input, and very often sent back to you a message that um, you had these issues. So um, uh, that's get the core working. That's not fault tolerant code. Something called fault tolerant code is code that um, will not crash, no matter what. And exception handling is the way you get to fault tolerant code. So that's important um, to handle those exceptional areas. So C++ has exception handling. Um, exceptional situations are just errors. There is a mechanism for signaling that an exception has happened, and that can be automatic or you can define it yourself. And uh, this is just a place in the code to deal with the exception, and we'll, and we'll see. Um, you uh, exception handling basics meant to be used sparingly in involved situations. I'm not really so sure I agree with that. Exceptions happen; you have to deal with them, and it's best to deal with them at a local level. Um, so we don't use them very sparingly in Java. I'll tell you that much. Uh, so I'm not sure I agree with the author on, on using them sparingly. You use them where necessary. Um, the reason the author is saying to use them sparingly is because they are essentially unstructured programming and that, that is kind of true, but still you have to deal with exceptions and, and they're not completely unstructured either. So anyway, we'll get some examples and I'll, I'll give you both my opinion and, as well as what the author seems to be saying. Uh, difficult to teach large examples. Um, you know, there's ways that you, you can have just one try catch block, which is what an exception handler is, and have it handle everything for the entire program. That's okay, except if the program crashes, you know, uh, seven uh, method or function calls deep and an exception is thrown, it's going to go all the way back to the beginning. The program won't technically crash and burn, but it'll go back to its, the very beginning part of where it started up, uh, which is okay I guess um, but you can put multiple levels of exception handling too so that it's handled at a very local level and we'll look at some uh, simple examples as well so they're talking about uh, the first example is this toy example um, is someone entering a number of donuts and then uh, entering the number of glasses and then saying that the DPG um, which I guess is donuts per gallon uh, is equal to the donuts divided by the, the uh, milk and then outputting all that. Um, the basic assumption here is that you know, the user never enters zero for milk. The problem with it is that they enter zero, we get an exception, um, and, you know, potentially a pretty nasty one. So uh, one fix would be 
uh, to put an if statement in. But, you know, let's look at it uh, assuming that we don't even have that if statement. If we just run this, we'll get what's known as a divide by zero er error. So I'm just going to go ahead and comment this out so you can see what would happen if I entered zero. So number of donuts, let's say eight. Number of glasses of milk, let's say four. We have two donuts for each glass of milk. What happens if I enter in nine donuts and zero milk? And um, yeah, we get something that doesn't quite quite well. It gives us an end of program here. Um, and uh, an, an ugly sort of message right here that doesn't make a lot of sense. That was a divide by zero error. That message wasn't too bad. Um, let's pick this up here, and this will be the fix. Notice if milk, um, if there's no milk, we get a divide by zero error. The program should accommodate unlikely situation of running out of milk, so you, we could use an if statement, which is what they used in uh, right here. So this is not an exception handler. We're not at exception yet. We're just essentially using an if statement to look for the obvious potential exceptions that could happen, and that would be an obvious exception. So if we ran this, um, we would get a better message. Um, Nine donuts and no milk, go buy some milk. So we do get that. But again, that's still not using exception handling quite yet. So an exception handling is done using something called a try catch block. And again, you may have gotten that in Java. <clears throat> if you took Java with me, you probably got it. With other teachers, I'm not so sure. Um, but a try-catch block is essentially what you're doing um, is you're taking the code that could possibly cause an error and you're putting it in between a try, word try, which means try this, and catch is if an exception happens, you can catch the exception down there. So that's a try-catch block. And again, um, you may recognize that from Java. If not, what it basically means is that if an error occurs anywhere in the code between the try and the catch, instead of the program crashing and burning, which it normally would do, it actually will go down to the exception handler and we could retry this. Now, um, some uh, programming languages uh, don't support try-catch blocks at all. Uh, but C++ and Java both do, and um, I actually am a fan of them. I think they, they work really well. They're a good way of locally handling programs. So we could try this one. Uh, so what's going to happen is we're actually going to throw our own exception called Donuts. And an exception handler in um, C++ is a little different than Java. In Java, an exception handler has to be a Java class. That's not the case in C++. An exception handler could be almost anything, actually, um, including just a plain old integer. So we can say throw anything, essentially, and, and it will catch it. So um, in this particular case, we're throwing donuts, which is just an int that we haven't even assigned a value to. So this thing here, this exception handler, would catch anything where the exception thrown is an int. And it doesn't have to be donuts. I could throw zero, probably, and it would work. Um, or I could throw milk because that's an int and it would work. Um, and you have a throw command in Java as well. Um, not sure if even I covered the throw where you can automatic, where you can, uh, as the programmer, explicitly force an exception to happen. I think I covered when 
um, something in the program caused it, but not you specifically. But throw works in Java as well, in case um, you maybe you got the try catch block, but you didn't get that far. That does work in Java as well. All right, and we could try this one. Now if I enter eight and two, works just fine. If I enter nine and zero, uh, we get that message, go buy some milk. Same uh, output as before, but we're throwing a try catch in here. And this doesn't seem like much of a benefit, it actually seems longer. But then you got to realize that um, try catch blocks are designed to really catch any error that happens. This is one that we know might happen, but something else could happen as well um, that we have to worry about. And you know, if we're, especially if we're working with what's known as scarce resources or volatile resources like files and databases, and you definitely could have that happen. So the toy, in the toy example, the code between words try and catch, same code from ordinary version except we have the statement, we simplify the statement, we're just saying if the milk is less than or equal to zero, throw donuts, um, which will cause the program to branch. Um, so when I do this, all the rest of these commands here are skipped, it goes right down to the try catch block. And this is why the author is saying we should avoid using uh, try catch blocks or exception handlers, is because this is a... Um, like a go-to, an unstructured jump. And that's kind of true, especially when we'll see some examples where you may be calling another function from a try-catch block, the exception happens in that other function or even several function deeps, and all of a sudden the program transfers all the way back up uh, what we call the stack to the, pro, you know, to the nearest try-catch block, which could be three or four functions back up. So that statement from the author about this being an unstructured jump is true, but I think um, having programs that don't, uh, that are not fault tolerant, that don't handle exception situations uh, well, is worse than um, what's technically an unstructured job. It's not a, a totally unstructured job. A, a go-to really allows you to jump anywhere in the program at all. Um, a try-catch block, you're jumping, you're falling backwards an unspecified number of function calls which is not great, but it's not totally unstructured either. So um, I don't know that I agree with the author completely on that. So something exceptional is caught after the keyword catch, and an exception again is really just an error. An error has occurred and that's it. In the toy example, the try catch block handles the normal situation. So in other words, everything between try and catch is what's going to happen if no exceptions ever happen. So this is the normal flow of the program that we expect to happen. And then everything in the catch is going to be um, the exception. And this provides for separation of normal from, so this is, this is good, um, you know, separation as they say. So all the normal stuff, you know, happens between the try and catch and all the exceptional stuff happens in the catch area. I think this is a good way to organize the code. So even though there's that structured issue, I still think try catch blocks are a good thing to use. Uh, it's not a big deal for this ex simple example, but important concept later on, yeah, because you can have a lot of different types of exceptions, and being able to organize the exception code like that, I think makes the program very readable, and even structured, more structured in some ways, so um, I definitely think it's a good thing to do. Basic concept of an exception handler is try, throw, catch. So the try area has all the normal code and it contains code for basic al algorithms. 